I find it very helpful when talking about any sound system, or any sign system, or any communication system, to think in terms of four S's. Sound, sight, sense, and structure. It's a mnemonic, it's easy to remember. Um, and so if you take language, which is our, our, our main thing here. I'm emitting sounds at the moment, okay? So there's phonemes in what I'm doing, but there's also intonation curves and stuff like that. But it's all to do with sound. Sound is really important. It's one aspect of language. Sight, of course, well, you can see me too. There's that dimension of what's going on here. But we use sight principally, of course, linguistically for reading, for graphology and all the rest of it. So and this is part of the kind of medium transferability of language, of course. It exists as sound and sight. And it gets around in the world in those ways, and they relate. Crucial, absolutely crucial. Quite a lot of people, when they approach language, just approach it in terms of meaning. No, that's a quarter of the effect, if you like. Um, sound and sight, what you hear, what you see. And the, the final one, structure, how the things hold together. Grammatically, it's syntax in terms of a text, it's cohesion. Uh, bigger frames, it's genre, it's discourse. But anyway, how things hold together. It's helpful, any and every text, and ultimately virtually most sign systems, can be approached in terms of those things. Sound and sight and sense and structure. To cover the bases differently, in the middle of that page, there's a, a series of steps which you can regard as a kind of um, escalator going up or down, as you wish. At the bottom there, stairs, steps, stages, levels, you'll see it's got word as sound. Are we all on the same page, literally? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then word as sight, so word as sound, phonology and prosody, that's what I was just talking about, word as sight, graphology and layout. Then we come up to structure of individual words, um, morphology, and then we come up to word choice, lexis, vocabulary, addiction. Then we come up to words together, combined, phrasing, collocation, chunking, bits that you break things down into. Go up another level, if you like, in the written form, formal written form, sentences. In the spoken form, utterances. Um, they relate, but of course they're not the same. We go up again to text structure, cohesion, the whole thing. You could regard this whole lecture as if you like... A, 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 um, a text, and kind of text, genre into textuality. Well, this is variously describable as a lecture, a workshop, uh, an education session, or whatever. And those are ways of describing it. Go up again, language variety in context. This is part of broadly educational or academic discourse, if you like. Language variety in context is quite a nice way of seeing discourse. You can have the power dimensions as you wish. Then we've got language and culture as a whole. Uh, I put W slash H-O-L-E because I like doing that kind of thing. But also, uh, it's a way of demonstrating that actually while the language appears to be a whole, a notional totality is actually full of holes and it's moving all over the place. I'll give you an instance of a whole. The big OED Oxford English Dictionary contains about a million words. There's probably another million not in it. Okay? That's a whole. You know, the whole of language, but it's actually got holes. It's full of holes, full of gaps. Just as there are gaps between my words at the moment, and so forth. So that's language, if you like. English, broadly conceived. A matter, it's not creation from nothing. It's creating from something. Okay? Recreated as something else. We never start with the tabula rasa, with nothing. We always start with language as it exists in text. No creativity without constraint. The idea of limitless creativity is nonsense. There has to be constraints to give things form, to do with times, places, persons, and so on. And you'll be getting a few constraints as we move. Creativity is not sloppy, goes anywhere freedom. Okay? It's actually about measured freedom, response to circumstance. A deadline, as you know, is wonderful at focusing the mind. <laughs> In that respect, it's a lifeline. Well, your first engagement with a verbal text should be to read it out loud. Viva voce. 
Uh, and then it's not only a series of ideas, oh, that's an interesting idea, oh, that's an interesting idea. It's a word. Word um, is, comes from a Germanic verden, and it means a becoming. A word is a becoming, as in weird, weird sisters, weird, and so on. It's something that becomes, and it only fully becomes if it's activated, articulated, and exchanged. It doesn't do all those things, it's not a word. It does not, it's not got a full becoming. I'm just going to do a reading of this text, which clearly doesn't primarily exist as you'll see, and you may know already, as um, a spoken text. But I'm going to put it into speech, because, you see, it's obviously primarily written. It's a note. Anyway, here we go. So this will be one realisation or interpretation. Somebody else, and you'll do it in your groups, would read it differently. But this is how I'm going to do it. This is how it's realised for the nonce, for now. This is just to say... I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious. So sweet and so cold. Okay? Now that was a realisation. Now people could do it differently. They could mutter that, they could mumble it, they could shout it. This is just to say! <laughs> okay? No. Do it. Volumes, intonations, attitudes could be very offhand. This is just to say, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox. Okay. So you, it can be realised, and each one of those articulations is a rereading and an interpretation. Notice interpretation has an art analytical sense, but if you're talking about musicians or actors, how do they interpret work? They interpret it by playing it. Yeah? You interpret a symphony, a chamber orchestra, a, the latest cover of whatever it is, a Bowie. You interpret it by doing it. And that's what we also do, as well as the analytical stuff. Interpretation is both, if you are active and passive or critical and creative. Now, you're going to do something, you're going to do them separately. Um, all the groups to my left here, decide how you want to play it at the back there. Um, what I'd like you to do um, is, yes, I want you to write a note back to the person who left this note to the person who pilfered your plum. Okay? You other guys, to my right, you're going to... Um, I have a different kind of response, you see that they relate, and I want you to analyse this text, but I want you to do it in a particular way, and it's, it's recorded under the tips under those stairs, late, uh, those, those stairs earlier. What I want you to do is talk about the thing you first notice, then the second thing you notice, then the third thing you notice. Now, if you've done it before, all right, it's, it's kind of territory already. But focus, first of all, what's the first thing that strikes you about this, analytically? and then the second and the third until you've finished. And you've got um, six minutes to produce a note back and six minutes to produce... Okay, now I want you just to be aware of the two things that are happening in very various heterogeneous ways from you as responses to this one text. A text which I'm now going to realise again in another kind of performance, not deliberately different. But think, just think, yeah, you're responding with the text that you've produced, you're responding with your analyses. It has transformed. However you put it, whether it be critically or creatively, it's transformed. And it's done so 
not just through a process of kind of stimulus and response from me. It's, it's happened through exchanges here. Change and exchange mixed up. So this plenitude, plethora of responses, which we're going to get into a minute, it, are, are f from this. It is one that's become many, although it is itself many, because I'm going to do it again. This is just to say, I've eaten the plums that were in the icebox, and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me. They were delicious. So sweet. And so cold. Um, okay. Can we have some of the texts that were notes back from, can we have one from here? Well, this is just to say back that I'm glad you've eaten them. If only it was just about the plums. <laughs> you've done it again. Thinking everything in this office belongs to you and you can just take it. Great. <laughs> and the context filled out and a whole set of attitudes. And I'd be interested to know how it's set out on the page. Is it continuous or is it actually lineated? Lineated. It's lineated, okay. Yeah. So you picked up a formal constraint or cue from the text. You've come back with a response. You've filled out your own particular context and all the attitude and so on. Now, you could analyse that, of course. We'll get on to those things in a minute. But it is a response. If you like, for the sake of the word, it's a creative response. But clearly, it's also critical. It's critical because you've been weighing up what's being said in this text and how it's being said. So it's not that it's separate from the critical faculty. You didn't suddenly go, Bleh! create. You thought about it and you talked and you processed it. So it's, that is a creative critical activity with the emphasis on the creative. Can we have another one from here? Don't care. They were update anyway. Diarrhea possibility. <laughs> right. And how is that set out on the page? Again, you've done it like yeah. that. Okay. So a different line. No mention of diarrhea <laughs> in this text that we've got. But there it is. You've introduced it as a kind of consequence, a punishment, if you like, a very moral text. Yours <laughs> was a kind of complaining thing. And yours is a sort of, you will be stricken in your bowels. <laughs> because of nowhere. Go on, clear. Okay. I knew you would eat them. Indeed, they were for breakfast, but not mine. I regret I cannot forgive my sweet, who is now so cold. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sweet! <laughs> so you've taken that word and turned it into a kind of screw. You've pushed it in so cold. You. <laughs> My love for you is cold. Cold applies to everything associated with you. Yeah? That's yeah, it. So, so what you've done is reinvested those words. You you put them across to your centres. You were you had a particular attitude and a kind of morality and this was a complaint and this was a kind of well, oh, you know, we're done. <laughs> Maybe. Can we have another one from the back? Okay. Um, yeah? Nice I and loud. I just have to say, I cannot forgive you for taking what is not yours. I'm glad you enjoyed my sweet fruit. My morning is also cold and broken. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Pay You see? Some people get very agitated. Yeah. <laughs> and you're just kind of... <laughs> okay. A whimper. A plumless whimper. Okay. You see what you've done there? You change the attitudes and the feelings. Again, is yours written out in linear form like that? Almost certainly people do because they pick up the cue. Uh, yeah, you know, this is obviously it's continuous. There's just two sentences in the Carlos Williams. First two verses are one sentence and then the, the, the third verse is another. Uh, but regardless of sentence structure, if you like, or overriding it, you've gone for lineation. You've gone for lines. And if verse means nothing else, it means changing line. Verse just means turn. It means a turn, uh, as in revert and whatever, all the verse words. It's a turn, and it means you introduce a turn over and above or under and beneath syntax. So the line is crucial in verse. Rhymes, maybe, alliteration, maybe, but the line is absolutely crucial. So we'll start with you. Could you give us two, three, four critical hits 
rewrites in their own way, but now in a critical idiom of the Carlos Williams. Right, okay, so we've got for a five point. So, uh, we decided it looked like a poem, the word is sight, and we can see the shape. Okay, so you started with shape, looked like a poem, got space and stuff. That helped us identify what kind of text it was. Yeah. And then we started looking at word choice. Yeah. Um, then, Any particular words cropped up? Um, yeah, plums, icebox. Okay, icebox, so where in the world is this if it's an icebox? America. It has to be America because we tend to say freezer. Um, okay, and that's a kind of cue for context. But yeah, words and plums and anything else after that? Uh, which was text structure and then the word combination. Okay, what do you say about text structure? Uh, what do we say? We just, I don't know, it's poetic. I think it's, um, mm, it's a bit of feeling. Um, it's actually not poetic in lots of ways as far as the language goes. Sorry. It's the way the lines were broken and how the standards were set up. Yeah. So the words are very ordinary, actually. They're not what anybody, by any stretch of imagination, would call poetic in an archaic sense. But you read it as poem, you're, you're prompted to read it as poem, as you said, because of the earlier instructions on space and stanzas and stuff. Uh, but the syntax, as I say, it's, it's um, just two sentences, and, and all the words are quite short. Aren't they? There aren't complicated words there for conversation. Thank you. Can I have another one? Um, your, your hits in, in order? Yeah, so the first thing that struck us was the capital letters and the one first line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the one seems to be a bit foregrounded. Then we have um, also the structure, the, the gap um, just before the ends. Yeah. So, so yeah. we notice lack of punctuation. Okay, so it's interesting. What what you're playing against is, oh yeah, this is a, a title that stands out, as you say, it's foregrounded because it's capitalised and yet it's part of the text that follows syntactically. And, um, and at the beginning of a, the, the, the um, <coughs> verse, as it were, we used to having strictures on sentences not beginning with and, say, and then you've got an idea of what punctuation could or should be like this and it's not there. So you're reading it against potential alternatives. You know, so it is indeed foregrounded against the background and you can be explicit about your background to do with what makes the title, how the sentences begin, and um, yeah, the punctuation. So you're doing background foreground. Um, and, and the background is insistent for you uh, in, in defining your foreground. Could we have some more? Uh, it struck us what kind of text it was until actually much later in the process, which was interesting. So we had another six kind of text as a okay. after we've gone through the other things first. Yeah. Um, we mentioned then other languages of culture, the references to Icebox, which defined it as being American or yeah, yeah. UK. And then the last thing we had was intertextuality. Um, and we came up, actually, and Pete came up with. Um, Noticing that um, the references to so sweet and cold yeah. as an act of revenge. Yeah. Revenge is sweet, revenge is a dish revenge. that is so cold. And we yeah. actually that then made us cause this kind of rethink the whole poem as an act yeah. of revenge. Which was actually something that you guys picked up, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was the sweet, <laughs> cold. <laughs> <laughs> that was the act of revenge. You enacted what you analysed. Yeah? They were both interpretations, and they're both performances insofar as you say them, but they are, as it were, Two sides the same coin. Can we have another three from here? Well, uh, from you three, what have you got? Um, well, we notice that the last stanza is the only one that is emotive, has adjectives, mm. iteration, and repetition. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of picking up other aspects of structure and word choice and kinds of word, as you say, adjective. Um, and interestingly, analytically, in terms of grammar, adjectives, but also in terms of attitude, sense of revenge, that's collocation, really, sweet and cold, sweet, revenge, cold, uh, and enactment, you're all circling around the same kinds of things. They're all responses, but they're all similar and yet different. And that's what we're after. And if you'll see that if we wanted to do a comprehensive, sort of blow-by-blow -blow account, we could just dance up and down all those steps with this text. Across sound and graphology, because do you remember how it was sweet, so delicious, I was really wallowing in the sibilance there, you know? Because they get the, the lips moving, that's, yeah, and, and, and it kind of invites you to do that. And notice delicious, shh, 
Although it's written ICI, it is, of course, another big sibilant. Delicious. Yeah? Sounds important here, as is graphology and layout, and that's where we quite often come in. But you can work off through uh, morphology. Icebox is an interesting one. Icebox is not a box made of ice. It's uh, a cold box. And as you said, it's culturally specific and it moves this is in the States and so on. So that the morphologically into word there. And you come up through word choice, and then you come up to sentences and suprasentential structures beyond, like the verse in, in verse form, uh, or the text as a whole. This Williams text is two sentences, but spread over three verse units. Um, and as was pointed out, the second one begins with an and which would be taboo in certain kinds of formal writing, but it's actually part of the same ongoing sentence, yet it has prominence because it's the universe, and so on. Okay, so those steps, they're not there for you to do a kind of route march up and down. You know, start with word, vision, sound, what's next? Oh, morphology. Have to the you know, boring, boring, boring very thorough, may get you a high B. <laughs> but the interesting one is, this is what hit me. Yes, that one. And then this, and then that. And hey, I hadn't noticed, but what I thought was kind of number six in the list, ooh, really, that's the big thing, isn't it? So in your writing up your essay, whatever, you move it forward. Okay? But any and every text can be subjected to those manoeuvres. And they can be subjected to those manoeuvres critically and creatively. <laughs>